Good evening, everyone. I am Sam Barnes from the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of art, literature, theater, social justice, film, and of course, music. I'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor of tonight's event, City, and share the following brief video message. Now, I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Grammy, Academy Award, and Golden Globe winning musician, DJ, songwriter, and producer, Mark Ronson, moderated by John Caramonica, a New York Times pop music critic. The duo will discuss Ronson's creative process, prolific career, including his latest solo album, Late Night Feelings, and his collaborations with some of music's biggest names, including Amy Winehouse, Lady Gaga, Adele, Justin Timberlake, Miley Cyrus, and Bruno Mars. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to John Caramonica and one of music industry's biggest stars, Mark Ronson. It's Mark Ronson. Hey, it's John Caramonica. That's emphatically true. Hey, everybody. Hi. Thanks for coming. So nice that y'all spending the Friday night, too. Not like a Tuesday or anything. Yeah. Like Friday. Yeah. I mean, I don't really do anything on Friday nights, though, so I don't know. No. The, when they asked me last week, they're like, hey, can you just tweet again? Because the ticket sales are slow. I did think I was going to be looking at a more empty. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. We appreciate everybody. Um, so we're going to talk for about an hour, and then at the end, we're going to take some questions. Um, Mark and I go back a little bit. We go back to the mid-2000s, maybe psycho-spiritually a little earlier than yeah. the mid-2000s. Um, so I know Mark's very famous and popular right now, and we'll talk about those things. <laughs> no shots. We'll talk about those things. But I want to go back to the late 80s to the mid-90s. Okay. So... <laughs> You were a very well-connected in the music world. For a, for a New York teenager, even for a New York teenager, you were yes. sort of very well-connected into the music scene in that era. Yes. So before you started DJing, can you tell me a little bit about what it was like to be basically like a cool 13-year-old who had a lot of, uh, had a lot of fa I, famous music and music industry adjacent friends in New York? I will definitely say that I lean towards the self-deprecating side, but now I'm saying, like, in full honesty, I was not a cool 13-year-old. Okay. Like, definitely well, not. Well, I just, okay, I'll just skip. Right. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was interesting. Cool. Um, but, um, no, I was, I was super into music. It was this era in New York. There was this sort of pseudo-hippie scene at the Wetlands with the Spin yes. Doctors and Blues Traveler. Hootie and the Blow. Hootie and the Blowfish. Why Hootie and the Blowfish used to play Wetlands? Um, Real talk. So my band would play all ages shows there. You and described it to me as shitty Wetlands funk in New York Magazine in 2007. I did. Yeah. I feel bad because the rest of the band probably didn't think that that was so nice. Now's your chance to apologize. But uh, if it was shitty, and I didn't know we could curse because it's the New York Times, but yeah, it would have been my fault. Um, so Someone told me we couldn't. So you would play in bands. We like were that. playing, in, and we really loved all these bands that were around at the time. There was bands like Living Color. There yep. was this scene in New York, the Black Rock Coalition. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the musicians we were a mixture of white, black, mm -hmm. Chinese in my band, and so we looked up to them. And we just played any all ages shows that would kind of have us. So it was opening for Spin Doctors, Wetlands, playing up and down Bleecker Street, and then I got. My stepdad, who's here, who is, there he is up there. Where's my stepdad? I don't know. Where's, where's yeah. the family? He's, uh, was, there we go, right there in the was, fifth row. Yeah, a big inspiration, because he you know, was an amazing guitarist, songwriter in the band Foreigner, and would let us use some of the equipment to record our shitty demos. Sorry, okay. wolf. Let's embargo that word. Yeah, OK, it's off. We're um, off that. And, uh, and, and then at the same time, I was super getting into hip-hop and listening to Stretch Armstrong and Bobito mm -hmm. on the radio. And uh, 
we're trying to figure out a way to incorporate this into the band. And then I realized like any time we had invite a rapper on stage, we sounded like a not great bar band with a rapper on top of right. it. Like we weren't the roots, let's be honest. <laughs> okay. um, so I kind of was listening to all these New York radio and getting inspired and thinking, okay, how can I do this? I'm definitely never going to be a rapper. I didn't know anything about producing, so I got turntables, which mm -hmm. my mother, who's over there, was for my graduation present, was 1200s. 1200s was very kind to uh, get me and, uh, and that's good mixer, solid that. mixer. No, I had a really, uh, I had like the Gemini Scratch Master, which was the cheapest mixer that you could get. It was eighty dollars. Okay, and uh, it was. It was this wide and it had a crossfader and yeah. it was had everything that you needed. Right, the basics. Yeah. So when you started DJing, obviously you end up being kind of at that moment, the, if we're looking at 97, 98, you end up the kind of preeminent New York nightlife DJ. What did it take to get there from wetlands, basically? Yeah. Um, I, uh, well, I, would, I started to go out and I would see DJs like Stretch Armstrong and mm -hmm. Funkmaster Flex and Clark Kent and mm -hmm. other downtown DJs that I really looked up to and I'd kind of just like watch them. And, uh, and then I would make these little mix tapes or mix CDs and go and basically pedal them to club owners. I would yep. find out what the cool clubs were, um, go and just be like, here's my CD. And I think that I was young and cheap labor, like I don't know what it, like that, well, it just was, be, I stay up in people's faces and eventually I got a, some gigs opening for some of those, those people that I really looked up to. And that's, and you know, I mean, that's the, the economics of that, of that system are very much like, you'll take 50 bucks for, for the eight till 10 slot. Yes. And eventually you work your way to the, to prime time. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's funny because we were talking backstage about how so much of that era is fundamentally pre-internet. I mean, the internet existed, but social media didn't exist, and things that we all kind of take for granted as a cool party where there's rappers and rock stars and models and business guys, like, that seems super normal now. Yeah. But in 96 or 97, that was strange. Yes. You were there setting the tempo for those rooms. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like getting all those people in the same room. Yeah. Because I remember certainly coming from like the hip hop perspective, there was a little friction from our side, but yeah. I wonder from behind the decks what you actually yeah. saw out in the room. Well, there was like a, a, there was like a kind of a wide array of gigs that I used to do. There was a sort of high end like Cheetah, mm -hmm. the, where you would see like Jay-Z. I mean, I remember one night Jay-Z and Biggie coming down together and it was one of their birthdays. So they were wearing these matching white hats, like these, like, yeah, I know. And I couldn't believe, you know, here were these guys. I didn't start off doing those parties. Maybe I started off doing like little hole in the wall clubs where, you know, you would still have luminaries, but people like DJ Premier or Brand sure. Nubian. Sure. And uh, actually I thought like, not that I ever harbored any grand illusions of entering into your field, but I used to write for like these hip hop, some of these hip hop zines like Ego Trip and On The Go writing album reviews. You wrote for On The Go? I wrote a brand newbie, an album review. Amazing. And it wasn't my favorite album of theirs. And, I, and, and then I had to deal with seeing them at the club three Lord nights did later. Lord, did Lord Jamar run up on you? Like Grandpa was just kind of just staring at me. I don't even know if he knows who I was or I was just projecting, but I didn't have the stomach for it, certainly. <laughs> So, so I was just like, this isn't, I can't just be a pretender in this field. I'm going to What is worth on the go want. never returned my, my phone messages. So, you know, okay. you have that on me. Okay. <laughs> um, and so when you're in these parties, like you said, they're, and yeah. you're actually kind of describing two separate scenes. We're describing a hip hop scene that's yeah. kind of like operating in its own ecosystem. And then you're describing ultimately what happened at Club Life, yeah. which is... So, everybody in the same room. Yeah, and I guess just for the sake of this to keep it brief, I guess I started off in those more hole in the wall kind of clubs and then I would start DJing. There was this cool club or the the hip slick, whatever you want to call it, high end club was life. Yeah. And they had this DJ there um, in the side room, they had a sort of VIP room. And uh, every week I would beg the manager, Steve Lewis, I'd be like, let me come play. You know, I was like this hungry, scrappy kid. and. He would be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, and, uh, and one day the DJ, she was eight months pregnant. I think she went into labor and he basically called me wow. like, do you want to play tonight? I was like there in three minutes with all my records. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, and I just killed it. I just knew. I was like, this night, I'm going to tear, tear the walls down. I'm going to let them know like, what a real DJ is. No offense to DJ. I think her name was Clementine. I was mm -hmm. like, this is just going to be my night. And, <laughs> DJ Clementine here. Yeah. By any, no. That daughter is now 18 years old, which yes. is sad to think. But, um, <laughs> So I, and, and so this side room at Life that used to play sort of this lounge, trendy background mm -hmm. music suddenly became known as the hip hop place to go on a Friday night. And I remember my turntables were right next to the staircase so I could just see everybody coming down and be like, Chris Rock, Prince, Jay-Z, like all these people coming by you. And these were my heroes. And yeah. I'm like, I can't really, you know, it was, it, kick to be playing for them. It was a kick to be playing their own music for the people that you really dug. And no, we, 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 I wasn't aware that we were in the middle of a scene or something interesting happening. But the club owners at Life would have this manager's meeting every Tuesday. And I would hear from my friends who worked there that the, the kind of club promoters who liked the house music and the Euro and the model -y and were basically kind of, I guess, just racist, were like, Mark Ronson and his brand of music are like ruining the clientele of our nightclub, you know, like coded messaging. And then, uh, and then every Friday I would just, you know, kill it and I got to play there. <laughs> right, exactly. You're like, that's cool, cool opinion. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna go wreck it. Here's Princess here, yeah. so, so there, I don't there, worry about you. There were definitely, it was, a, I loved that night. That was a little bit more of the glitzy thing. And then I loved getting to open for Funk Master Flex at the yeah. Palladium and Planet Rock. And that was like a bit more like, uh, a bit more of like the raw side of the scene. But it, all of it was just so much fun. I was 23 years old playing for my heroes and like playing for people dancing. And there was this mix of sort of, you know, rappers, mm -hmm. regular New York folk, skateboarders, models, artists, drug dealers, athletes, just yeah. this nice, yeah. New York. As every good club should yeah, be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At that point, I think it's something we probably take for granted now, but being a white DJ playing hip hop clubs, did that come up? Did people ever press you or like sort of say you shouldn't be here? Is that a thing that ever happened? Um, no, like, I mean, occasionally there was someone like drunk when I was coming out of the club, like one of the more like, I don't know, just like, grimy nights, maybe somebody would be like, where the fuck are you going, white boy, or something with my crates. But no, never had that like in the club. And it was, I was coming from, I wasn't the first one, like Stretch Armstrong, of Duke of Denmark. There are people that really kind of just were there before. And, and hip hop, I mean, as we all know, is very much about the, it ain't where you're from, it's where you're at mentality. Sure. And Funk Master Flex and all these people kind of were definitely what do you call it? What's the word in the mafia when they say they vouch for me? Right. They so so it was kind of like they co-sign yeah, yeah, yeah. co-sign co the hip hop version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there would be occasionally like there was this era when the sort of mashup thing happened, which I I always sort of resented that word because it was a bit cheesy and like of the blend. moment. It's a, it's a blend. Exactly. It was very strange when yes white people discovered mashups in right. the early two thousands. I was like, have you heard? Have yeah. you heard a blend tape? Yeah. Very weird. So we yeah. were just throwing like. Things like an MOP a cappella over Led Zeppelin break, or of you know, and Karis One was rapping over ACDC, Back in Black, and I remember occasionally uh, there was a rock and roll remix of the Benjamins. Do you remember that oh, yeah, one, of course. the heavy metal version? Was Jimmy Page on that, or no, that was like a Cashmere. That was from Godzilla. Godzilla. Yeah, this was the this was the rock band signed to Bad Boy Entertainment Fuzz for a bubble. short Fuzz Bubble Fuzz for a bubble. short amount of time. This Fuzz, is going to get they so might know who Fuzz, the two of They might know who day. Fuzz Bubble is. The guys have yeah. a show of hands if anybody's heard of Fuzz Bubble. Yeah. Just us. Yeah, just us. Anyway, cop that 12 inch. Talk amongst yourselves. Thank yeah, you. yeah, cop that yeah. It's on Discogs, cop that 12 inch. Um, but but I, I was, you know, at this point I've been playing just hip hop and R&B and reggae in these clubs for a while. And I was like, it'll be fun to play some rock and roll. The yeah, White yeah. Stripes, Seven Nation Army, there were these things happening that yeah, were sure. interesting in this blend. And, and so I would play records like ACDC Back in Black. And I remember playing the Benjamins and being like, okay, if this is the biggest record at the time, Puffy, Big Ear on it. And I was like, if I switch to the rock remix for the last verse, no one's going to get mad at me because it's like Biggie and it's right. whatever. And then I can go to ACDC right there. And this is just so nerdy. I'm sorry. But yeah. then I played the ACDC record and I remember there was like a drug dealer at the banquette behind yeah. me who right. was like bottles everywhere and was just definitely like showing off and having a good time. And he just did not like when I played the not. ACDC back and back <laughs> and just like leaned over in the most like, what the hell are you playing right now? Kind of like gave me this look and but 
most of the time I was playing then the you dropped and stuff. People were hypnotized fine. and you were just like, we were fine. just go right back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you understand the musical choices that you were making at that time in a set? Did you understand it to be kind of part and parcel of what hip hop had always done, which is kind of be omnivorous with other genres? And like you say, KRS One rapping over ACDC and ACDC and so on and so forth. Like that was something that was kind of uh, part of the DNA of the genre from the early 80s onward. So did you understand that the decisions you were making on the turntables were in essence an extension of that and a part of that? I think that I probably had some idea that that was the spirit of it and there were those collections called Ultimate Breaks and Beats, mm -hmm. which were these compilations that were pretty much like the, the groundwork of hip hop mm -hmm. and all the things. So it could be something like the Incredible Bongo Band of Patrick, could be the Monkeys, Mary Mary, mm -hmm. just anything that sort of had a great mm -hmm. break beat. So I was kind of aware of that, but I think that I was just probably f lucky too that I just had the same omnivorous spirit. Like that's what appealed to me. So I don't, I wasn't, I think it was just lucky that what I liked and what work sort of lined up. When did you sense, because that, that was a bubble, like that late 90s nightclub, New York nightclub era was definitely a bubble. Did you sense that it was coming to an end and is that part of what shifted you towards production? Um, I actually always wanted to produce. So the whole time, I actually got into, so I played in bands and then I got this MPC 3000, which was like an early digital sampling workstation. And I always actually wanted to make music and that sort of was the original goal. And then the DJing was a bit of an offshoot of that, which took on a life of its own and paid the bills. So yeah. I sort of ran with that. But the whole time I was kind of making records, but I hadn't really found a style or a unique thing yet. So I guess my first album, Here Comes the Fuzz, I got to make really because of my name profile in New York City clubs. Yeah. So, th you know, they were like, DJ Clue, Funk Master Flex, all these DJs had these mixtape albums. Mm -hmm. But it really wasn't until, I didn't really find my footing until a little bit later. So no, it wasn't any conscious decision. But I remember I met a kid recently, he was like 20. And I was talking to him, he grew up in New York and he was like, man, you grew up in the 90s? Like, what was that like? And it was like, nobody in the 90s thought it was cool. Like, no, he's like, yo, we're in the 90s, how crazy is it? Like, like, I think that, and of course it's like Midnight in Paris, everybody romanticizes an era before and obviously the Joan A. Hill movie, mid 90s, I understand there's a lot of nostalgia for the, what was happening in skate culture and music. Of course, but, in yeah. retrospect, it was the Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, but it's just like, I guess it's like we weren't aware that it was something great happening. We're just showing up for work every night and we certainly weren't aware that it was like over. I just like pictured people in like Rome being like, this is the midpoint. This feels like the midpoint right now. <laughs> um, so, so, and I, you know, I would actually go to parties to DJ sometimes and like Kanye really for a while had me as his DJ and would mm -hmm. love to, to like, I'd be out there playing his Grammy after party or something sure. for late registration. So like mid-2000s vibes. Yeah. yeah, and he'd be like, this is Mark Ronson. He'd be like on the mic, this is my favorite DJ. And like I was flattered and inside I was like a tiny bit just like burnt because I was like, but I want to be a producer yeah. like you, you know, like in my head. But sure. I was like, I can't be mad. Like I haven't produced anything that is any good yet or that anyone likes. I can't like run around going like, why don't you know that I'm a producer? So I was always Kanye having- West, why don't you know? Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Um, so, so I guess uh, I was just not biding my time, but I guess developing a style. And, it, and w then when I finally met Lily Allen and then Amy Winehouse, it was like the perfect people to sit about the time where I'd sort of honed a bit of a sound that we could like, to, to, you know, to work. So when we're gonna talk about your most recent album, we'll get to it, but really from that time period, then you always kind of found counsel and kind of common cause with female vocalists. I mean, if you skip past the first album, yes. which is a lot of, I was saying, a very good Spotify era album. Yeah. A lot of guests, a lot of, a lot of different styles. But Lily, Amy, all the mid 2000s stuff, what do you think it was that gravitated you towards them and them towards you? I don't really know. I, like there was just, I thought about it a lot and obviously because the most recent record, which uh, like you said, we're gonna get mm -hmm. to, but they were just, I don't know if it was, um, if it was just 
coincidence or those are the people that I met, but I was always just drawn to, uh, maybe it's because I have a wonderful mom who was just Good like answer. amazing. Solid. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe I also just grew up, you know, it was just me and my mom and my sisters growing up mm -hmm. for a lot of the time. So I maybe I was comfortable. And there's no way for me to feel like I can answer this question without getting into hot water either. Uh. It just feels like it could be full of like gross generalizations. But I was definitely always inspired and kind of drawn to like really like strong, independent, powerful women artists. And, and also, so during that time period in the mid 2000s, things started to pop for you in terms of production, but I know that you were also DJing on East Village Radio, which is like was RIP, a little storefront on First Avenue yeah. off of First Street. So you were maintaining sort of a quasi-normal New York life as all these things were happening. Yeah. Did that feel novel? Because when you were in the DJ era, I mean, obviously 4 a.m. comes and you just go home and sleep it off and DJs weren't superstars yet. Yeah. That was a pre-thing, but you were kind of doing this balance in the mid 2000s. Were, was you cognizant of it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that was just, I was still, that was still, like I said, sort of how I was paying the bills and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and it didn't, I, I still love DJing. Like I, it, I never was like, okay, I can't wait till I blow up so I don't have to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember DJing, um, like when Amy was out here and we were demoing out the songs for Back to Black. Like mm -hmm. I remember her coming with me while I DJed like a pizza parlor one time, you know, like she was just, just like, hey, this is where I'm going and I ever want to come. And yeah. It was like a trendy pizza parlor. I can't remember what no, it was. <laughs> it was like a slice. I don't know what it was called. Something. Okay. Um, and, and, I mean, and if that, they could afford a Mark Ronson gig, they must have been, doing, yeah. They must have been doing okay. Um, and, and so, no, I really, and I think that I just sort of came from this mentality like, like, what am I too good to be saying that was no to a DJ gig or something like that? I right. don't know what it was. I just, I wasn't like, I can't wait to like get put on because I'm going to tell you all to go s screw yourself in your pizza parlors. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. When did you sort of arrive at what became your production voice? Like, was it during the first Amy sessions? Was it during Lily work? Like, where do you think you kind of like landed on an idea that felt honest to you? I think the first thing that I really did, even though I was really proud of the work that I did with Lily, and it was only a couple songs, it was still just a bit of the same, the extension of what I've been doing before, going to record stores in the East Village, looking for a break, like going through the records, taking a record to the turntable, listening to me like, oh, this is cool. And I remember Lily was with me on an A1 on East Fifth Street, and I would put the headphones on. Do you like this piano line? Cool, let's take it back and make a song out of it. Um, the Amy thing was a, a bit more transformative because it was just this sort of like amalgam of all these styles inspired by her songs and what she wanted to do that we were just sort of making up as we went along. And, yeah. and then taking those demos and then to the Dat Kings and just sort of on a bit of a whim of being like, all right, and then let's get these guys I know in Brooklyn who make this great music that sounds like 1967, let's get them to play the music. So there are all these really great um, yeah, a series of events that happened. And, and so that was the first thing where I felt like I found a bit of a, uh, something unique to me. Did the, the stuff that you were gravitating to, like on a production level, was at least part of that premised upon, well, I used to DJ and I used to search for breaks and I used to, you know, like that's, you're, you're sort of like a break first. Yeah. And yeah. I think other producers come at it technology first or melody first or whatever, but you're very much break first. I'm always drawn to like the sound of the drums. And I remember the first day that we went in to record Back to Black and um, I walked in and Homer, the drummer from the Dap Kings was playing mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe that they had this sound that sounded like every drum break beat from my sure. dreams that I'd spent all of my life like right. going around these East Village record stores looking for and all over the world actually. And here's this guy and he's just playing. He's it just sounds doing. like yeah. 1966. And then the fact that they were recording it, what happens when you're recording, you're hearing the playback slightly delayed off of the repro head they call it. So not only is he playing this thing that sounds like my dreams, but 
he's, it's actually the sound is coming out later than he's playing, so I'm having this full like surreal <laughs> experience. Like I feel like I've just like left my body. So I mean, I was also trying to keep my cool. It was my first time yeah. in Bushwick at the studio. I was just like, oh, this sounds good. Yeah. And inside <laughs> my head, I'm like, this will work. This is wild. And so yeah, and but not only was he like a break beat, but it was like part of this huge band and he could play drum fills and I'd be like, oh, but can you go like, whatever, can you play this part here? So that was a, that was a bit of a revelatory thing and it wasn't like I invented it. It was something that I found that they were doing that they certainly hadn't invented either, but the kind of thing of them all together with Amy's songs and her voice and the arrangements that we had is what kind of made it what it was. Do you find, do you find that in, in those examples and also subsequent to that, part of what you're gravitating towards when you're working with a singer or trying to find a person to work with is someone who works in that context, someone who could fit with the kind of like the breaks in your mind and in your heart. I think in the beginning I really did because I was so drawn to the drums and, mm. and what that sound was. And even when we were doing Love is a Losing Game, I didn't, it was written as this ballad on the nylon string guitar and I couldn't think, unfortunately the thing about spending your whole life DJing and being obsessed with making people dance is sometimes you just have this internal disco ball spinning in your head and you have to like <laughs> shut it down because... We asked them to take it. Uh, yeah. They had one before, Thank but you. we asked them to take it down. It's sitting in James Murphy's house yeah. somewhere. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that uh, like on that song, I really had to like learn like, okay, sometimes the drums aren't as important. Sometimes you have to honor sentiment first and emotion. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm, tr so now it's a bit more of like a balance between those things, but, uh, I still do get very turned on by, uh, a good drum beat. As, as <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's Drummers, it. <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> as someone who is authored and produced a lot of very popular music, do you experience yourself as someone functioning in relationship to the center of pop music like you know like a max martin figure or louis bell or whatever like you know there are people who that's their entire life's work is living just in that kind of like fixed center you kind of like dip in and out like show up every now and again yeah like, yeah here's a here's a smash and then yeah. go away like no i'd but, like but, to be in the center much more than okay. i am no. <laughs> well um no i i i can't I understand now, and I have a hard time like even admitting to any of the, these things just because of my own insecurity. It's just us here. Self-esteem, whatever it is. But it's like, totally safe. I'm, I always just think, I remember when Uptown Funk won um, and I was reading the New York Times the next morning and I was like, it was only 6 p.m. We had just won record of the year the night before and mm -hmm. I was like, this is it. Like three weeks from now, I'm gonna wake up living in a trailer in Utica. Like I'm sure I'm gonna have no more good ideas. Like every time one of these things happens, I definitely think it's gonna be the last. I'm always surprised. So what I'm saying is no, I don't think of myself existing in that middle mm -hmm. lane, but after a few records and you start to be able to tell yourself like, okay, and it's not like a fluke every time. Sure. Um, but I think that what I try and do is make the things that really excite me or really excite me and the other artists or the other writers in the room that feels like it comes from a genuine place. And then what you can do is add all the candy and the extra stuff and the production and the ear candy to give it the best shot of maybe being a hit or having a place right. where you can chop it down from four minutes to 3.15 because you want it to be played on Spotify or right. whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. But, but the initial, where all those songs were, I guess the biggest songs I've had, like Locked Out of Heaven or Shallow or mm -hmm. whatever, like they were just written as accidents that just came from a point of strong emotion, whether it was joy or sadness or empathy at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then what they became is, is, you know, what they became. Although I imagine with the Bruno stuff, I mean, you talk about big disco balls. I mean, with the Bruno stuff, those records feel I don't know if it's in the mixing or the mastering, but there there's something in the poly, in the in the last yeah. 
you know, the, the polishing of the car after the car wash. Yes. There's something in that <laughs> phase of yeah. the record that feels very specific and like definitely a choice. Yeah. Like we could have left it a little rusty. We could have left it a little creaky, but actually no, yeah. we like tied it up tight and then sent it out of the, pro yeah. out of the off the production line. Is that, you think about a Bruno record differently from an Adele, from, an Aga, from a Gaga and so on and so forth? I like, definitely learned a lot when I was working on, because Back to Black we sort of made as this really just, it was made in almost just two weeks and it was such an emotionally raw record, there was no expectation for it. So there was no record company going like, we need this to sound more radio. Like, so we were just able to do the most honest thing. And then, right. uh, my own record version was sort of like just something I made basically in my own studio just to play out those songs in my DJ set. So mm -hmm. like all those things were these sort of like uh, unintentional right. records that became bigger. Um, and then the things that I did after that didn't quite emulate that success. And I, it wasn't until I met Bruno and Jeff Basker and I went out to work on Unorthodox Jukebox and they were like telling me like, okay, well then when you write the song then you have like, the hook, but then you need a secondary hook, and then you need a tertiary hook, and this is this thing, and, 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 the, and all these things, and the chorus melody has to go, like, start at a note that's higher than the pre-chorus, and, yeah. you know, they weren't writing from, like, this cold calculating thing, they just had more tricks, and they had their eyes on this bigger prize, and I was like, oh, cool, this is how these guys have big hits, like, yeah. Jeff had done Fun, he had done Kanye, All the Lights, yep. Bruno was, like, couldn't not write a hit song for himself or anybody yeah. else, yeah, so I was like, Cool, and I was inspired by that. I was like, I like this idea. Like, I was in England at the time, and even though I'd born in America, it felt like this. I mean, I was born in England and grown up in America. I was living back in London, and here I'm coming to LA, and I was like, it felt like very much like these these Americans know what they're doing. Yeah, right. They know how to have these hits, and they've <laughs> yeah. got rules, and these right. things. If you follow, and you it's work all math, hard, then you just yeah. carry the one, and yeah. it's good to go. It's McDonald's. Like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But funky. Um, and then, uh, and so I, I was kind of inspired by that. And I had had a solo record, record collection come out that hadn't done that well. And I was going into my album Uptown special. And I was like, I want to make, like, be in, make it like these guys make it. Like, really yeah. concentrate and not leave anything to accident. So, accident. So that, that idea of what you said of the extra layer of polish on the, and the wax on mm -hmm. the, the extra layer of wax on the car, I did learn that from Bruno and Jeff. And, and I think it's just knowing when to not overcook something, but it's okay to. And to, and to that give point, Uptown Funk chance. is your record. Right. I mean, no cap. Right. Cap to Bruno, but like, right. that's your record. Right. It's on your album. It's on my album, but I mean, I've said this many times, but I mean, like, Bruno's creative ideas and like the spout, like, you can't stop him like there's so like that record could have easily been on his record as well it wasn't like i brought a finished track to bruno and was like hey say something cool on this right but that was like that was all four of us in a room working our asses off for seven months you know right it was like a really yeah but i guess the main point is where the record came from the initial jam session in bruno's studio that was this really fun three-hour jam of bruno on drums me on bass jeff on keys was we were just with these big idiotic smiles on our face like jamming yeah, like we got it. so like you want the song to have that spirit so the listeners just dancing not being like god it sounds like they worked a long time on this song you just sure. want them to be like, <laughs> right 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 um, when you do those jam sessions are you always putting everything to tape just so you can access it if you need we to we put it we put it when i jam with like the guys like the the dap king truth and soul guys that's to tape but we just like record to digital like they're not the, you know, I'm not as like super precious vigilant about, the, about it. Right. So when you have the song that's uh, frankly as disorientingly popular as Uptown Funk, and I imagine it was disorientingly popular to a certain degree. Um, we were like, did we write the Macarena? <laughs> yeah. Did you? I don't know. That's or my maybe question. it was Mambo number five. It was something. Like, I remember Bruno being like, yo, this is crazy. Like, when we hit the seventh week at number one, and, like, Bruno's, like, very good at, like, deflating any, like, crazy ego, like, stuff, too. He's like, I was like, this is crazy. He's like, yeah, I know. We wrote the Macarena. Or, like, Mambo number five. Yeah. Like, Shouts to Lou Bega. Get him. Cause, get him. Yeah, because we all know the best songs ever and not the ones that do the best. Like, so, yeah. So when you have a song like that, 
how does that make you reflect upon the, the other parts of your production practice? Because I'm sure there's an urge, and I think I read in an interview, maybe you, you, you alluded to this once, there's an urge of saying, well, like, I did it once, yeah, and it was nice and lucrative and et cetera, et cetera, so I could probably do it once or twice more. Yeah. How much was that urge present for you, and then did you get past that urge? I think it's like there's, it happened the first time with Back to Black, and because that was my first success after 12, 13 years of, of like just being a struggling producer, I was like, oh, so that's what people like when I do that. Yeah. I should keep doing that. Yeah. And then I realized I like let that sound run itself, drive it. And then with Uptown Funk, of course, there was a the temptation to be like, yeah, we want something like that, but you know, for our movie. And then you sort of entertain it, and then it feels a little gross gross and then yeah. you I have to keep remembering like you never knew that you were going to make that song when you went to the studio that day and all the best songs that I've worked on are, or maybe the biggest ones really are like I said those those accidents of inspiration and so you just have to be like the next thing that you make might not be half or a tenth as big as that one but like if there's any chance of it being good it's going to come from like a place of honest inspiration right a thing that's been happening a lot in pop music over the last five years, you know, you think of the Blurred Lines lawsuit, and I know there's been Uptown Funk, there's been suits filed about that. How much does that get in your head when you are trying to be in that pure place? Because obviously you think, you're talking about Uptown Funk starting as this kind of protean jam session, and I'm sure you're running through a hundred ideas in that jam session, yeah. and one of them gets blocked out and turned into something. But we're in a weird litigious age. People think that ownership, there's like a chain of ownership of a, a drum hit or a fill or whatever. When you're trying to be in that pure open place, is that ever lingering in your mind that like the world is cruel to this? The world, um, you know, the will not judge this the same way I'm feeling about this. I think when you're, when you're just sort of in the really most, in that open creative thing of the beginning, the genesis of the idea, I think you're just trying to tap into something that feels like it's out there almost, and you're just bringing it to you, and then you can sort of edit it later, and then we can listen to it and be like, oh, that sounds a bit like that song or yeah. whatever. But um, no, I mean, I know pr producers and stuff who like have like music copyright lawyers like in the studio while they're writing, so someone can flag something, and then if they get suit they, they can go well those guys were in they didn't flag it so we're okay so, so it's yeah, yeah yeah basically yeah so so there you know there's all sorts of crazy things like that that i hear about but i just kind of have to just keep doing what i do and be a little bit more cautious but if i start editing so much then it's too scary do you th do you think that that kind of instinct that's been reoccurring now because fundamentally like everything's a copy or a rip off yeah. like you know it's like there's not there's only 12 notes. Yeah, there's 12 notes. There's there's a few drum patterns. Like there's ultimately yeah. everything is an amalgam. So do you worry that we're in like a tie in where it's overly litigious in and in matters all across this? It feels like it. I don't know if we've hit like the tipping point yet, but I mean, look at, and I'm certainly not comparing us to Nirvana, but like Kurt Cobain used to talk about all the time, like, yeah, it smells like Teen Spirit. A lot of my songs, we would just jam on like a Pixies. Yeah, of course. The whole thing, from the verse to the chorus would just be the same chords but with distortion on it. Like the Rolling Stones would talk about how they would jam on a Beatles tune until it sort of More. amorphosized into something, metamorphosized, it's a crazy word, um, into something accurate, else. Accurate word. Yeah, so, so, um, so it, is, it is a little, uh, it's a little like hairy the times that we're living in, but I feel like we'll, I just have faith we'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to talk about Shallow. I'm okay. excited to talk about Shallow. Okay, cool. Um, shallow is, shallow is uh, in the Ronson oeuvre, stand, to me, standalone. Like, it's, you right. know, it feels like it operates outside of the, the planetary system. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk about arriving at that, because obviously you'd worked with Gaga previously. Yeah. So maybe if you could talk about what it was like to kind of switch zones working in her kind of headspace, and then how do you land at something kind of as crisp and clean-edged and pure as Shallow? Yeah, I mean, Shallow is just another one of those kind of like going to the studio having no idea what you were going to write that night. I mean, we knew we were writing for the film, and right. she had a few ideas going into it. She had that, like, I'm off the deep end like, yep. lyric. But... Um, 
Yeah, I, I remember it was night. It felt a bit spooky. Like we all had these headphones on because she likes to sing. It's not just everyone around the piano. She likes everyone to put their headphones on and she has the mic. So right. her voice is so close in your ear and she's so nuanced her singing, she can make a hairpin turn and do something in her voice that sends the song in a totally different direction. So it's, um, it's kind of cool to have that. And I remember when she sang that, we were kind of fumbling around with some chords. My friend Andrew had the guitar. And when she said, tell me something, boy, when she sang that, like all my hairs went up in it. I think I was in a bit of a low place and, and relationship wise and just, I think, I think we all were kind of a little messed up and going through something and I yeah. think, that comes in the song because there's like melancholy, there's triumph, there's yeah. a lot of things mixed up in that and maybe why the song feels kind of so honest. And yeah, and I just remember feeling like, okay, this is every now and then you go to the studio with talented people every day. There's it's never a day when you're just like, this sucks. But you're aware that there are some days like, yeah. this is a little more special than what we were doing yesterday or six hours ago. Right. Although, to, to go back to what you were saying about being in the 90s and you're not like, we're in the 90s. Like, I, I think sometimes on the outside looking in, when people think about how pop music gets made, there's a perception that everybody always knows, like, today is the day we made a masterpiece. Yeah. Like, and it's not, like, if you go to these studios, you go to these studios in L.A., and it's literally just these, like, campuses of different rooms where everybody's, like, plugging away and, like, praying, 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 yeah. that they will stumble upon a yes. genius idea. So it really is. There's an intense amount of unseen and unheard labor yeah. that leads to the moment of kind of elegance yeah. and, and synchronicity. Yeah. Um, do you feel like having, because you'd worked with her previously, like you had a, had a rhythm, like a sort of an established we had rhythm? A, we had a rhythm and we had been working. We were actually still maybe working on Joanne at that time. Mm -hmm. And we took some time out to work on the Star is Born stuff. And uh, so, yeah, we had like already like a bit of a, we had an, a, an honest, a pretty quick, honest, almost like sibling type rapport yeah. that we were able to go to that place pretty to access that honesty in that song easily like it didn't it wasn't like okay what are we going to write about today let's get like i think that she was just like a bit of an open book and at that moment almost like maybe an open wound like we all kind of were so i feel like that's a bit even though we're writing for a character and alley and these kind of things like it that's i think that comes across in the song why it feels like maybe more than just a song from a film because it's a song that is just a i don't know a song about hurt, pain, getting mm -hmm. through stuff. And I think that's also probably why the song had such a potent life independent of the film. Right. You know, it lives in the meme ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's a stand, I mean, you heard it on Z100 when yeah. it, in a song that's structured like that. Yeah. That's not uptown funk, you know, to yeah. live on Z100 is, no. it must be doing something yeah. very particular and special to, to kind of catapult into that space. Yeah, I, I think it, I mean, obviously the first time that I saw the film, I had no idea that the song was gonna end up in the film the way it did as part of the plot and the narrative and yep. all this stuff. And when she's in the parking lot and she sings it to the first time, I was like, oh my God, this is insane. And I'm watching the film, like Bradley Cooper had just edited the first hour and 15 minutes and it very kindly invited me over to like watch it. And I had already rehearsed, like, okay, if it's not good, I know I'm just, I'm just like, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this yeah. before. Yes. Or like, a um, a accurate. That's an accurate way and, to flex. And, and from the opening thing of his band and, like, when that way it's all cut and edited, I was, like, already, like, I'm into this. And then when it got to that thing, I was so moved. And, my, like I said, my hair sort of stood up. And I couldn't wait to sort of get out of there, like, to call Andrew and Anthony and be like, you guys are not going to believe, like, when you see this film, like, what they've kind of done to the song, and especially that moment when she goes on stage. It was just about up to the point where she, like, goes on stage and, like, sings the thing, and it was just super moving, and it's, um, yeah, so I think, and then when I saw the trailer, and they, they had our song, and I was like, damn, they're, like, doubling down. Right, <laughs> really, they believe. Yeah, and the memes, oh, yeah, my the God. Memes. Do meme. you, are you on Twitter like that? Like, do you see the memes or on, on Instagram like that? I have a meme guy, no, I, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> that, no, we should I, all yeah. have a meme guy. Yeah. Um, I can only hope if I ever get memed that I have a meme guy yeah. that, like, just forwards them to me. I think Elon Musk has a meme guy. I no think. doubt. Um, yeah, I do, and then, of course, but I, didn't, I was kind of being, Silly, but I, when I say I have a meme guy, like, 
I'm not as in touch with everything as I used to be. There's like a 25 year old person who works at them, but like, hey, Mark, do you yeah, FYI. Do <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, I did, so I saw that and it was, it was pretty great. Does that in a weird way feel kind of as validating as whatever chart position or how it feels? Because like there's the way that music functions today is not how it functioned 20 years ago. It functions as the soundtrack for TikTok videos and it, the lyrics become memes and yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's, it can, it can get dissociated no, those in a way. Can, and that, that's as valid a form of success yes. as the old fashioned, like number seven on the bullet on, yeah. the, on the billboard chart. Yeah, and those things can be just as important bar barometers or even greater barometers yeah. culturally, how relevant your stuff is. And you know, Billboard's still trying to figure out their chart and it's, mm -hmm. it seems like sometimes even a bit arbitrary. It's like one tenth of your Spotify streams equals one sale of a thing and mm -hmm. it's like plus one chestnut, like who knows? Yeah, no, it's true. And, 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 and it's like, but is, should it be TikTok? Like, should it be all the, like, it's so, yeah. So a meme that like gets retweeted 100,000 times is just as valuable to like people knowing your song. It's, it's, it's and, definitely a wild time. And those are like micro level emotional connections. That's sort of how I feel about the meme ecosystem. It's like radio is passive, right? Like yeah. You're like, oh, I like that song. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to switch from yeah. Z100 to 97. But with a meme, it's like a person had to make a choice. They had to like feel excited and then press send yeah. and share it. And those are like little individual emotional connections. Yeah. I think those are far more valid than like aggregated audience mm -hmm. on like New Music Friday or whatever. Mm -hmm. No shots if anybody from Spotify is here. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe slight shots. Uh, okay, so you have a record recently yes. and uh, it's called Late Night Feelings. Yes. You said something to my colleague, Joe. Yes. Shout out Joe. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing. But you said something to the effect of, I didn't feel entitled to melancholy. And in terms of like choosing who you were gonna work, like. Right. And I wonder if you can expand on that because I think it kind of touches back to, I'm a DJ, I want yeah. a producer. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I think in my head I was always just like, I'm the club guy, or like, you know, my record should be kind of bright and shiny. And then when I work with an Amy Winehouse or Queens of the Stone Age, I can get a little deeper and that's, I do, I do, substantive music over here and then this is where my records reside and they're like these fun party things but and i think a lot of it had to do with the fact that like um i don't want to get too much into like my therapy routine but i also think that like <laughs> i wasn't in a place where i was ever really honest or open with my emotions so it's there's a, not a huge chance that you're suddenly going to be honest and open in your music if you're not sure. really like that in your daily life so with this record, because of like you know, divorce and separation and all these things, and actually coming off the back of working with Gaga and Josh Homme and people that demand and wield honesty so yeah. well in their music, I think I was just like, I just had to make this record. I wasn't like, okay, I'm going to make my deep, honest record, but it's just like, and whenever I tried to do something like fun, like it would just be like, wah, wah. like it, I just mm, needed to yeah. like, and I was also, it was really fun because I was like noticing these more melancholy chords and melodies and stuff come out of my hands. And I was like aware that this was better or more interesting or more felt more heartfelt or meaningful than some of the other things that maybe I'd been working on. Did you, do you feel, I mean, you know, sometimes you talk to an actor and they're like, you know, I do one for them and one for me. I do like Fast and the Furious 37. Yeah. And then I like go to Wyoming for six months yeah. and like really get in the woods and you know, like does the kind of juxtaposition between the uptown funks of the world and then this, and, and to be fair, the Miley record got some traction. It's, yeah, yeah. it's not that it's purely one or the other, yeah, yeah. but do you feel on some level, the decisions that you made on this album were kind of like an abnegation of some of the other stuff? I No, I don't think so. There was nothing that, present in the in like the kind of delineation of it I was just like this is the best most honest exciting to me record that I can make at this point yeah and I just think that like of course it's great to have chart success and all those kind of things but I've never had chart success trying to chase chart success so I don't think that I would know how to do that and I love Max Martin and he's made yeah. some of my favorite pop records slappers and I, yes and I've spoken to him and I know that they they have like a little bit more of like a system of how you make those songs and like you said even the time of day 
Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. What time? Well, it's like I mean, they just fund asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, they work. They work, from what I understand, like a pretty conventional nine to five or mm -hmm. ten to six. Because I was talking to Savin, who works mm -hmm. with him, when you remember when the weekend started to work with yes. them, and they were initially concerned because the weekend comes from he like works the hip hop night, ecosystem, night. right? So they yeah. were like, we don't know, like we don't. Is he going to be able to show up at nine right. a.m. and really like you yeah. know go into room four and like bang out a melody? Yeah. And they were like, we don't change our system for anyone, right? And so the weekend showed up at right maybe nine thirty. Okay. You know? Yeah. But but that's they were very like rigorous about okay. it, and I I think you hear it in the records, yeah. like that rigor is one yeah. of the defining characteristics of those records. Yeah. Um, but now you know, nine to five. Okay, okay. So, so I gotta wake around. up a couple hours earlier. <laughs> right, nice. we all could stand to do that. Um, all right, we're close to a Q&A okay. portion, but I have like the first, I mean, it's like a last question, but it's really like the first Q&A question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I promise on Twitter we talk about hair care. That's right. Yeah, and so, you have really good hair. Thank you. No, 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 this is real. And I, I want I to like talk about the- I as well. I, I'm working on it. I wish it had more body today. I got it cut a couple days ago. Usually it's more floral. It's We're both cool. doing well for our age. I, tell, say it to the cheap seats, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about your hair evolution and what's in there that's giving it that kind of like, um, it's just standing there. I think there. at this point it's just hair memory, but I also, um, I think that- uh, You don't have like egg whites in it or anything? No, uh, I use this product actually that uh, it's, it's by this company called Bedhead. Yeah, okay. It's called Queen for a Day. I wow. didn't really realize I was gonna be wow. shouting out Bedhead this evening. Wow. And certainly not You're gonna get free. like a, box, a, a yeah. crate of that to deliver to your house. Yeah, um, and, and that's it. And, and you I, just- Zooms just it up. Blow dry my hair for five, for maybe two to five minutes. Solid. Not blue, even, right? like maybe less. And then it's pretty short. It's gonna stay. It's like a buzz cut. It's gonna stay out like itself right now. Sure. Yeah. What about you? Uh, <laughs> I use. I mean, this is a fair question. So I use two different shampoos. Okay. Um, I have a really good thing called. The company's called Evo, it's called Liquid Rolls. Okay. And basically what it is is after you get out of the shower, so your hair doesn't stay limp, yeah. you put it in while your hair's still wet. Okay. And that way when your hair dries, it, it dries with nice a little curl. volume. That's nice. Because I was finding that my hair was drying and it was like drying down. <laughs> and then I spent two days oh, kind yeah. of like pushing it and like adding things to yeah. it. But I just apply like a little dollop of that and it just like has some volume. That's great. I'll send you the link. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> If you see me with a sweeping I, that, kind of fringe next time, you'll know where. I'll feel, I'll feel good about it. Right. Um, all right, we're, we got 15 minutes left. I want to know what questions you have. There's a mic there and a mic there. So feel free to step on up and ask uh, something of moderate intimacy, but perhaps not overwhelming intimacy. <laughs> overwhelming for me, moderate for Mark. Hi. Hi there. Um, do, you mind, uh, do you mind if we start here? Is that OK? Oh. She can start. Is that okay? No, no, just I, I was given. Hair guy. I was given rules. First. I'm sorry. I'm I'm so sorry. Okay. All right. Mine's not too intimate. Mostly about how you choose collaborators for okay. like the vibe of the song. If it's like a back record label thing, or how you decide on the collaborator. Usually it's um. It's either so in the case of the Miley song, "Nothing Breaks Like a Heart." I saw her four years ago on SNL singing this country, like twang that I'd never heard before from her own pop music. And I just became obsessed and kind of like chased her down for four years. And so maybe like you don't know what you're gonna make, but you're just like, there's something about this person that like I know we could do something interesting. Someone like Angel Olsen was just somebody I was a huge fan of and just same thing, kind of like light stalking for like a couple of years. And then, <laughs> and then some people are like, like when I worked with Bruno, I didn't really, I liked some of his songs, but I, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure if we, what we would do, and he j we just met, and I just got an immediate vibe from him, and I was like, cool, I like this person, he seems super smart, and let's just go in the studio and see what happens. Awesome. Can I just add one, one thing to that question, which is, on the most recent record, you're working with established people, but also, you know, there's Yeba, yeah. uh, there's folks that people don't know. Yeah. And do you have different approaches going in the room with someone who has an established known thing 
and then someone who you're basically like, nobody knows. Like, you know, we're starting from zero I, point here. Yeah, I think the thing about all those people, even if they have varying statuses and maybe even egos, they all do something that I really love. So you're just like, okay, I'm there to amplify this thing of whatever their special superpower is. So right. that's kind of it. So it's not that different, ultimately. Not too different, yeah. no. Hi, um, I just want to say first, I love your honesty and sort of fun-loving self-deprecation. It's very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, it is. It's so refreshing. Um, the other thing is I, I, I had no idea that men had so many hair issues as women. <laughs> you guys are worse than we are. We're just starting. This is like, we're, we're not even at the, we're at the beginning of them. Um, and I just want to say, if I wanted to go out dancing, tomorrow night and go to your favorite place that wow. you know you might be or somebody else you really like <laughs> where would i go cuz studio 54 is closed um i don't, i i don't dj enough regularly in new york to be able to properly answer that question but there's a lot of dj's that i love that are really great like um is there a club that you like? Like One Oak? Soul Center to One Oak? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Want to Center to One Oak? There's a great club I night. I have a babysitter tonight. Okay, <laughs> Friday night, Soul in the Horn is a great club night where okay. they play great soul disco house and they have a, a band that plays in between the DJs and I'm spacing on the name of the resident, the DJ, her name, but Soul that's in okay. the Horn is a great thing to Google. Great. Everyday People, good if that's it. Everyday People is a good party. Yeah. Look for that. Great. Hey, so um, I know you talked about with Shallow how you didn't initiate in like a manufactured way and just, you know, look to Gaga and say, okay, what are we, you know, what are we talking about? What are we going to do? But how do you find yourself? I'm super interested in your process of um, creating and song creating with stuff like Joanne and with stuff like Shallow and how you initiate that process and you find yourself creating this amazing music that's super honest. Um, I think that the one thing is that you, that it really happens working with an artist like Lady Gaga, who is such an honest artist and was willing to go there maybe even more after records like Art Pop that were more like statement and kind of stuff. So I just, when I met her, she was just, it just seems like the most obvious thing, like what kind of thing do you want to write about? I guess I just asked her and she was just, I want to write the song by my aunt, and, you know, the Joanne song or whatever. And then with Shallow, you know, like I said, it was we were writing for the movie, but she was going through relationship stuff. I was too, and I think, I think you just have to be like a bit of a good listener and open conduit. And if somebody's feeling some kind of emotion, just be able to kind of read it and be like, okay, that thing you just said, like let's tap into that. I think it's just being a good listener. Is it hard if you're not in the same mood as the person? Like if the person comes in super boisterous and you're like, man, I've had a terrible day. Maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't do this. Uh, <laughs> maybe you should go find Bruno. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that is a good, yeah, maybe I, I think on my own records, I'd be a bit more like, nah, but like if you're there to work on somebody else's record, like in their service, the, the thing is just like being empathetic. To whatever they're at. Hyper speed, yeah. Sure, cool. My colleague. <laughs> Um, I really enjoyed uh, the mixtape about nothing. Do you think you'd ever do anything like that again? With with Wale specifically? Not necessarily just... with Wale, but sort of like a semi-obscure rapper where you like give them the tracks and wow. yeah. introduce it. Well, well the mixtape about nothing was really kind of Wale, like that was about when I met him, but he was obsessed with Seinfeld. So that whole thing was like a bit <laughs> his brainchild and I helped out with some tracks and good. But I used to love that. I used to make mixtapes all the time. I made like this mixtapes with my sister Samantha. Call it, we called ourselves the Holla Twins, like the bread that we put on the <laughs> cover for for like Rockefeller and like I don't know. So I would love to do that again because it's it's really fun and freeing. I just yeah, I just want it to be good. <laughs> Thank you. Hey Mark. Hey. Thank you so much for doing this event. I find it so humbling for. Um, people, uh, producers like you, actually be out here and giving us this kind of uh, insight. Um, I think it's humbling just to uh, have a little bit of insight into the industry. And um, I guess only question I have is, um, I guess people kind of like late bloomers, like starting late in the game, um, producing, singing, songwriting, what would be like your biggest advice? And um, I guess what really, how much of weight does networking itself really hold as opposed to just having talent and 
just being encapsulated in your art? I think that the best thing, and it sounds, I know it sounds hokey, but like finding your own voice. So when I started up, I was DJing in clubs five nights a week, listening to music by the Neptunes and Kanye, and like all the things that I started in the beginning sound like my versions of those things. And it wasn't probably until I met someone who inspired me enough and found my own unique thing. So I feel like it's like the most important thing is to like find your voice and whatever your thing that nobody else is doing with your lane, so to speak. And that's, that's kind of the surefirest way people are going to notice. And it might be 10,000 people as opposed to 10 million, but those people that hear it will love it and big you up and that's how your thing will start. Thank you. Hey, first of all, Huge fan, thanks for doing this. Uh, big hair inspiration, it's an honor. Um, <laughs> but, um, You're doing good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but I, um, as someone who's, I aspire to be like you at some point in my life, you know, your big influence on, uh, on me got me actually to want to be a producer. Um, I love the sonic palette you choose as far as like synthesizers that you use. Uh, do you have any like pieces of gear that you find yourself really going to like time and time again, like a lot of stuff on Uptown Special, Late Night Feelings are just kind of woven in really nicely into the music. And I want to just curious about like the gear you actually use. Yeah, the, like. the Juno 106, which is this great rolling keyboard from the 80s, which can like sound like kind of like crazy, like brassy kiss, like mm -hmm. era. I mean, Prince, like let's go crazy sound. And can also give like the super warm, kind of like synthy pads that are in late night feeling. So that is something that's such a great instrument. You can really hone it and to any kind of sound that you want. And then um, there's like so many great virtual synths now, like Arturia and those things where you can get all the Roland and Moog synths and the kind of like electric pianos that, that are also wonderful. So awesome. thank you. Yeah. Can we go lightning round? Because I want everybody to have something but we only have five-ish minutes, so my let's do lightning quick. round. My thing would be quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering, so I'm a musician myself, and I'm trying to like work on like a lot of projects currently, but recently I find myself in a bit of like a creative rut and I have some writer's block, so I'm just wondering, do you like have any solutions on like how to cope with that or like you just you go e yeah yeah <laughs> you go every day and if you're bored and you think you don't have an idea go on youtube and learn how to play your favorite stevie wonder song or silly dan song or whatever it is and when you start playing those chords you'll be like wait and you'll move three of them around and then you'll be like i, I think i have an idea percolating so just like play the new album is so great, and it really feels like an honest conversation between men and women. And so I'm wondering if you consider yourself a feminist, and if you feel a responsibility about how women are portrayed in our culture through your music creation. Oh my goodness, lightning rounds. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, you only have six seconds. I think answer. that... Uh, <laughs> you want to take my seat? You I have... <laughs> I, d I don't even, I don't know what the definition of feminist is. We live in like very like important times to get these kind of terms and stuff correct. So I feel like I've been lucky to be constantly propped up and bigged up by incredibly powerful female artists. And I'm just like, and, and that's my part in it and uh, yeah. Do you believe in the fundamental equality between the sexes? And oh yes, is that it? Okay, okay, yeah, good, just good, good. <laughs> Because I be paid the same for the same work and et cetera, et cetera. I, absolutely, I consider myself a feminist. It feels like. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, though. All right. <laughs> Thanks for doing a shout out to your mom. I'm a mom of a great songwriter, singer. And do you recommend, like you said, you have a meme guy? Do you think, like, <laughs> Instagram, YouTube, just getting out there and playing a lot of clubs, you know, is just the best way to get your music out there to be seen? Yeah, I do find, I, I mean, I go back to like the MySpace and even like the Friends era, how I used to find demos for artists and stuff. So Instagram, I've definitely discovered songwriters. I like even someone covering one of our songs I've been tagged in and then reached out to them. And so that's, that's a wonderful way to discover. Can I shout out her handle? Sure. At In the Land of Lala. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's Gatopia. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm... 
a 15-year-old producer, artist, as well as my friends up in the back. Um, shout out to those guys. We are part of a collective called um, Yellow Door. Um, we produce music out of my basement, and I'm wondering, just as a young producer, musician, you know, artist myself, what's the best advice you can give as a young person trying to make it in the music industry? Um, I think, I guess, partly of what I was talking about uh, to the question over here about finding your own sound or your collective with your crew of like what you guys do and then also just like putting up music as much music as possible like just is 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 great and just dm and harass people like me and whoever and send beats and be like because that's i do listen to that stuff as well and it is it is cool it makes us feel like we're like in the know so. i've never heard a famous person volunteer to listen to dm <laughs> music that's that you're very special yeah thank you <laughs> Um, well, perfectly like piggybacking off of You're that. You're about to DM. Um, yeah, Everybody's DMing you right he, now. My, my obsessive tweets, kind of like, you invited me here tonight, and I want to thank you so much for that, which is hilarious, because I was going to do that anyway. But um, the, <laughs> the, the um, question is, do you see yourself as like a music virtuoso, tapping into other, like continuing to tap into other industries? Um, obviously, I love the late night feelings, like muscle tank, but, uh, and the rebound, re rebuild the world with the Lego. I was wondering if there's anything else you had to say about that. Anything about what, sorry, tell me. Like tapping into other industries, basically. Oh, tapping into other industries? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just did something uh, with Lego, yeah. that's what she's talking yeah. about, and I just, I like Lego, so it's like, <laughs> Lego's cool, it's creative, I won't like do things like a lot of brand things, but if it's something that I think that's interesting, and it's like genuinely I can stand next to like a Lego house and be like, I love this, like that, <laughs> yeah. that, that's interesting to me. And it's creative and it's a cool thing for, I feel like, for people to still create with their hands and maybe not just on screens. Yeah. Thanks. Over here. So Valerie, it's a really wonderful evergreen song, and obviously it's a cover of the Zootons track yes. the year prior. Um, you know, it's the lyrics. Uh, I was listening to them recently at karaoke, and it's they're really kind of messed up, but it's also a really joyous song. Yeah. Um, because you did that with Amy, is that a song you would see as being sacred, or something you'd ever be opening to revisiting any any context? To doing what? Sorry, to remaking I... it, doing it with someone again? Or oh, remaking? Like, no. No, I, I, I don't think so because it could never be better than, I've, I love when I see people cover it or like I get tagged in a wedding video or something of somebody just like, you know. Um, but I think that she just, the original song by the Zootons that Dave McKay wrote, like you said, it's, it's a bit weird and messed up and these same things because that's Dave, he's amazing. And then Amy made it her own, but I, I think that I just leave it there. All right. Well, you know. my boyfriend just asked me to ask, you know, if he, I said any questions from Eric, and he said, will he remake Valerie with me? So it's a no. I will tell him <laughs> no. Okay. Thank right. you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. All right. We're at the zero point, but let's be quick. We get everybody. Okay, I just I want to thank you for your candidness, and uh, it's been really interesting to hear your stories and your experiences. So thank you for sharing those. Um, kind of following on some of the other questions, it's like I was going to ask you for the two top pieces of advice that you would have for someone like yourself, if you were just, instead of starting out in the 90s, you were starting out today, what would the two top pieces of advice would you give yourself? And also, how does gigging and playing at clubs factor in today, or is it really just the social media platform that you really need to cater to? I don't know if there's as many venues, because it is really just as powerful now to sort of upload your music. I mean, when you do see a great singer perform live, there's something visceral that happens that you maybe can't just get off a YouTube video, so that's, that's still important. but. I would just say like, yeah, just putting up the music through all these forms of social media, and I don't even know which one's still around, SoundCloud, Bandcamp. SoundCloud, Bandcamp, there. yep. Mm -hmm. Th those ones for sure. And finding your voice and just being prolific. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi, Mark. Hi. I'm a huge fan. Um, as a young artist living in New York City, I wanted to see what's your biggest piece of advice to just go out there and go for it and take everything and make it into a great opportunity no matter if you get rejected. What's your best piece of advice? Yeah, how do you deal with rejection? Not that you get rejected a lot, but- I did in the, in but, the beginning. But like, how did, you, like, how did you push through it? I think that A, I didn't really want to do anything else. B, I wasn't very good at anything else. <laughs> C, I just, 
I just, I would even, I would be DJing like Martha Stewart Christmas holiday office party, like, because I knew the next day I was going to go to the studio with Saigon or Rhymefest and make something that I'd be excited by. So I think it's just that belief in yourself. And then hopefully, if you're lucky enough to meet, whether it's for you, a producer, a writer, or another, somebody to, that inspires you and to complete your vision. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, I was just, um, wondering about the mixing process, if you have a large input in that, or if you just give it to some mixer you like and trust them with your song. Um, it's, it's varying things. Like now there's two mixers I work with the most, Tom Elmhurst, who's mixed Back to Black and pretty much everything. And then there's Serban, who makes Uptown Funk and the more like poppy stuff. He's amazing too. I don't mean to like demean him. So those guys I trust to a point, but I also love being in the studio and in the mix phase because you've just worked so hard and you've like sweated all these things. And then for like three hours, you just get to sit on a couch in the back of the studio and just watch someone else work and put the final touches on your piece of music. And so I like being involved, but it's also, it's, I like also letting really good people do what they do well. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Mark, I'm Mia. Um, I'm wondering if, as a person who creates music that is popular and is being played on the radio and all these beautiful things you're talking about, do you ever find yourself grappling with the permanence of millions of people hearing a song? Because I'd imagine you can't just be like, never mind, I rewrote it, this is what it's going to be now. Like, yeah. how do you grapple with that if you do? Well, I thought it was amazing when Pablo came out that Kanye just kept like re-uploading and changing the yeah. song. But like he he can do that. If I start doing that, people are like, all right, like it's not really on brand for me. It's not good for not good for a critic. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I remember that great piece you're writing. Like it was like at the eleventh hour of the Pablo feature that you yeah. wrote. Um, but um, I yeah, I think once is there something really freeing, like when you release a piece of music because you're so stressed it, but like at that moment that just goes out you realize you have no more control over it it's not yours anymore it belongs to everyone else and it's kind of lovely to just like watch it go out and it might connect it might not but i think you just like let it go cool thank you thank last two g'day mark duncan Hi. mckenzie mccarke here from australia how you doing um, as you know from my accent um kevin parker is a bit of a god in our country to um, me too this collaboration with kevin and Sia, is it going to come out? Are you guys uh -oh. banking it for a while? Are you going to have another jam session? Do you need a triangle player? What's the, uh, <laughs> what's the deal? I love you guys both, so yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I would love to finish it. It was a bunch of music that we had made, me, Kevin, and SZA, just before her record came out. And I remember her playing us her first record like three days before, and we just thought she was like this singer-songwriter came in, and we're like looking at each other like, she's gonna be really big. Like this is, a, there's like a Kendrick feature on the second song, like we were, our minds are blown and we're like, she's never gonna come back into this show. <laughs> so, unfortunately we were sort of right and it would, but I still have, <laughs> I still have this dream and fantasy that we'll get to finish because two of the songs I really, really, really love. So hopefully at some point, yeah, I hope so. This is a the cry for help publicly right yeah. now. It's, it's going. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Okay. Walk, so. Yeah, no. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, so I met you at Pegasus, Pegasus Horse Race. We actually took a picture, so hi again. Yeah. Um, I just graduated college from University of Miami, and I was, I'm trying to get into the music industry and music business. I was wondering if you have any advice on getting into A&R specifically. Uh, what was the last part? Advice on getting into A&R. Getting into A&R specifically. Getting into A&R. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you still live in Miami? I live in New York right now. You live in New York now? I think you have to find something because now the labels like even more like are looking for things that have already sort of like blown up or you're bringing things in and things become, I guess, you know, you know even more than I do like regional successes or, or whatever it is. So I think find something that's great already yourself. Yeah. Help develop that act or that talent or whatever it is and then you take it to the label like as opposed to the old school where you used to get the job at the label and then I think that's the way you kind of impress them and go in and, and do it. Yeah and right now the data you can't be faster than the data so the question is just like identifying a scene a sound or whatever and then getting trust in that scene or sound and then yeah it in because every record label has a whole team of people who are dedicated to finding someone on SoundCloud with 700 followers who's yeah. going to be the next Drake. Take in four or five things that you really love and like, you know, and then just be like, hey, I got these. <laughs> Here we are. Um, that's our show. 
Thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Thanks for that. I think we're, we're good. Yeah. Bye, guys.